Here we go. So welcome back to the Sarah Palsy and Fitness Podcast. I'm here with Doug Knoll. He is a lawyer. He is a mediator and a peacemaker born with various disabilities. Welcome, Doug. I'm excited to learn about you. David, it's great to be here. So uh, to, to start the episode, tell me a little bit of, tell, tell us of your background. How did you, uh, how did you, uh, I guess, uh, ha- or start to begin having these disabilities? <laughs> well, I was born in 1950 in Southern California in, a, in an affluence uh, and privilege. And unfortunately, <clears throat> I was born with partial blindness, partial deafness, uh, bad teeth, left-handed, two club feet, had four surgeries wow. before I was three years old. Couldn't walk until I was three and a half or so. Um, <clears throat> I, was a, I was a real mess. And the problem, the problem was back then, nobody knew what to do with a child like me. I had a really good mind. But uh, so my parents just decided that they'd do it the British way, stiff up or lift, lift and power through it. And I got no emotional support through a lot of pain, mm. physical pain, and emotional pain and they didn't know any better i mean i don't blame them i i love them and you know they did the best they could but it wounded me pretty badly um but i had a good mind and i ended up going to dartmouth college and after dartmouth came back to california and in those days if you didn't go to out of ivy league if you didn't go to med school you went to law school so i went to law school and uh clerked for a judge for a year, and then moved to Central California and started my career as a trialer. I did that for 22 years. In mid, mid, mid part of that career in the 80s, I took up the martial arts. And by my 40th birthday, I'd been awarded my second degree black belt. Wow. And, then I, and then I started studying Tai Chi. And Tai Chi has two really interesting paradoxes. The first is the softer you are, the stronger you are. The second is the more vulnerable you are, the more powerful you are. Soft to be strong, vulnerable to be powerful. I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> Did not get it. But I finally, it so, started to seep into my soul until a couple of years later, I was cross-examining somebody in the courtroom and the thought came to me, what the heck am I doing in here? And after that uh, trial, I had a long vacation and I spent time thinking about how many people I'd really served as a trial lawyer. And I could only count five people that I thought had really come out of the legal system better than when they went in. And I said, you know, if I'm going to do this for another 30 years, I don't want to only really help 15 people. I want to help a lot of people. So I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew that the trial lawyering part would probably over with. So the next Monday, when I was driving down out of the mountains to my office, I heard a public service announcement for a new master's degree in peacemaking and conflict studies being offered at Fresno Pacific University in Fresno, California. And I enrolled. And for the next three years, I was a full-time master's degree student studying peacemaking and human conflict. I was a three-quarters time law professor at our local law school, and I was a full-time trial lawyer. I was a pretty busy guy. Um, Along the way, my partners and I began to have discussions about what my practice would look like. We could not reach agreement. And so in late October uh, of 2000, I gave him one week's notice and walked away from $10 million and left my legal practice wow. and opened up my peacemaking and mediation practice. And that's kind of how it all started. Hey, so sometimes it's it's funny because uh, people think that... Uh... Money changes everyone, but in reality, if if you really are comfortable and passionate with what you do, sometimes it's okay to just walk away, you know, just like you did, even though it, at first you might think, man, that's a lot of money and it sings, but then you're like, this is all worth it. It's not worth it. I had the big house and the big car and the fancy lifestyle, big successful trial lawyer. It's not worth it. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I was miserable. I wasn't living in alignment with my values. I wasn't in a happy marriage, partly because of the stress yeah. of practicing law. And uh, I finally just said, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. I, you know, I took a risk, but I was following yeah. my heart and it turned out to be exactly, exactly. what I think to do. That's what it's all about. It's about what you are passionate about. Sometimes you have to sacrifice a lot of things that you make you unhappy, you know, and even yeah. though at first it's like it's rough, but then you're like, you know what? Maybe it was for the best. 
I don't feel like I sacrificed anything. I had some stressful years. The financial collapse in 2008 hurt me pretty badly, like everybody else. And, you know, I've had my years where I've been wondering where the next dollar is coming from. Right. <laughs> but, but overall, uh, although I don't make nearly as much money, my, my happiness quotient is, can't, is immeasurable. I've never been so happy as I am right now. Yeah, and that, that's, that's wonderful. You know, the fact that you're, you're happy, that's what counts, really. You know, happiness. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so uh, to continue, continue on has, has your discipline ever hindered you? Like when you first started, you know, kind of going into law school and. Well, I, I overcame a lot of it just by brute force strength and, and there were medical advances too. So my vision was at 2,400. Um, I, they didn't, my school, I, the, I couldn't figure out why I was doing poorly in school as a eight, nine year old until they finally, some school nurse had the bright idea to check my eyes. Now, of course, they do it as a matter of routine now. Back then, they didn't. And all of a sudden, they realized, well, no wonder he's doing poorly. He can't see. So I got Coke, big Coke lens glasses, you know, <laughs> with big black frames. And I was nerdy before anybody knew what nerdy was. And, uh, you know, then my, I, that summer, I accelerated three grade levels just because I was reading so much and really got into reading. And, and so... I had glasses for a long time. Then I then contact lenses came along and soft contact lenses, but then I got I, I started having some problems with those. So that's when I had RK surgery, where they cut your they cut your, the cornea, and that was like a miracle. Um, my vision was restored to 2020, no astigmatism. I mean, it was amazing. And then 10, 15 years later, I had LASIK to, to clean everything up again, and then eventually I had cataract surgery. I had my lenses replaced. And my my so that took care of my eyes. With my legs, um, it was my left leg really is the one that has always been problematic. It's a little bit atrophied and I don't have much, I have a little flexibility in my ankle, but just by a lot of therapy work, physical therapy, massage therapy, acupuncture, a lot of training, I've gotten the leg so it's pretty functional. Now, I'm at a place in my life now where I can't do things that I used to be able to do. I'm 72 years old. But for many, many years, I was extremely active. I was a level three certified ski instructor, of course, black belt, um, fly fisherman, uh, kayaker, rafter, rock climber. I was able to do all of that. I was never the best at, at anything, but I, I could do it. And I, so that's how I overcame all of that. So it was just one thing after another, you know, a lot of dental work to straighten my feet my teeth out. I've had just about everything that can be done in dentistry done to me. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's, Medicine progressed, and as medicine progressed, problems that I had could be corrected. They were corrected, and today I'm, you know, I'm, although I'm 72 biophysiologically, I'm probably closer to 59. Hey, that, that's not that's not bad. Yeah, no, I'm going backwards. So, um, so the so those limitations, you know, obviously they taught me a lot of lessons. I mean, there was a lot of wounding um, and a lot of compensation, but I learned how to learn, and that's how I was able to master so many different things. I've got a lot of accomplishments in my life. You know, I fly airplanes and helicopters and, you know, do all, play jazz violin and blues violin and all kinds of stuff. And, but I just learned how I learn stuff and I learned what it takes. And what I learned was that I'm really poor at when I start something that I really want to learn. I'm really lousy at it. I mean, really lousy. So lousy that instructors give up on me, <laughs> right? <laughs> but then all of a sudden I'm really good. It's like Matt, uh, um, uh, Gladwell's book. Uh, I forget the name of it. Um, anyways, it, it, I reach a tipping point. It's, this book is called Tipping Point. And, and I reach a tipping point where, where I just put in the hours of good practice. And then all of a sudden switches click and I get it and I can do it. And so I would only take up things that I wanted to do. I never took up golf because I just didn't want to do it. Um, took up jazz violin because I wanted to play jazz violin. And so that's how it works. And even today, I'm always a beginner at something. So, cause I like to learn. You know, that's, that's the kind of motivation my students need is, is the, the fact that they can do, they can do just about anything if they put belief in it and if they enjoy it, it's just, I don't know how you feel about this, but I feel like a lot of kids in, in, in this generation now, they don't really have the 
the strength or the motivation or the positivity to really want to learn, you know, and yeah, you jack I, about trades. I, I see that too. Uh, you know, one of the troubling things that I see is that far more women are going to university and to graduate school than men are today at our, at our law school, where I'm the chairman of the board of trustees, um, 80% of our students are women, only 20% are men. Wow. But the good news is that we live in a very diverse part of California and our law school population, student population reflects that diversity. So it's, that's really exciting, but, but mostly all women, far more women than men. Um, and there are a lot of people that are commenting on this. I, I, I'm not sure why, why it is that something has failed in our system. In our, and I think it's failed yeah. in our system where, where, where boys aren't being nurtured properly. So. I guess it's just a change in uh, generations. It's just like, I, I've been seeing a lot of change, like from your generation to, to my generation to, to now, it's like everything's evolving so technologically. And a lot of, uh, I noticed that a lot of children, you, you lose in their sense of the basics, you know, like how yeah. to do, how, how to read, how to do math. They rely on technology to do that for them That's instead right. of them do it. And, and even, help. even more importantly, David, they learn, they, 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 they're losing the ability to communicate, negotiate and solve conflicts. Right. Because and speaking about conflicts. Because they do it all through, they try to do everything through texting, which is a, it has its, it, it has its purpose, but it's not a universal communicator. Right, right. And speaking about conflicts, you're, you're, you're a mediator yourself. So I wanted to know, how, what's it like being a, a peacemaker and a mediator? Yeah, sometimes it's, uh, it can be scary, it can be frustrating. Uh, but most of the time, it's very satisfying. Um, you know, when I can take two people and bring them together to have a difficult conversation. And instead of having a difficult conversation, they have a transformative conversation. That's really an amazing thing to watch and to, and to facilitate. Have you, have you ever had, I guess, uh, have tried to mediate and it kind of like goes, it, it backf backfires for some reason? You're like I've, never, trying to... I've, I've never had anything really explode on me badly. Um, of course, I've had plenty of conflicts that I haven't been able to resolve because the parties didn't want to, want to resolve. I mean, if you're coming, if you're hiring somebody like me and paying me the, the big bucks that people pay me, um, you better want to settle if you, or, right. resolve, or resolve your conflict. Because if you don't want to resolve your conflict and you want to keep fighting, mm -hmm. there's not much I can do to help you. Right. It's a waste of money if, if you're not willing to. Well, it could be, you know, there are times when I get people in who would rather fight than be, I mean, me, they'd fight to be right. You know, and then I can I can work with them and slowly bring them around to getting the conflict resolved and reconciling a relationship. So it happens. You know, that's part of what my job is, is to take people who who are intractable and make them malleable and get a resolution that works for everybody. That's what I do. So is it is it do you work with mostly couples or any any individuals? I work with you name it. I've done it. <laughs> From working in maximum security prisons, training murderers to be peacemakers, working on at the Congressional Budget Office, teaching wow. senior how to de-escalate members of Congress, working with multi-hundred million dollar partnerships that are breaking up to uh, couples, you know, you name it. I've done it. I, 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 <laughs> I've seen it all. I've, I've done about 150 criminal mediations between victims and offenders. Wow. So... Yeah. Have you, like, if if you were given the opportunity to mediate like a presidential debate, would you do it? No. Really? That's not really mediation. That's that. But they they are they're basically they're not even facilitating. They're just sort of these news people up there are facilitating this debate, and that's fine. That's not what I do. Okay. Um, I help people solve deep and intractable conflicts. That that makes sense. I mean, I mean, even when the media is involved you know it's like it's it's a it's a circus you know it's not really like you said it's not really mediation i mean and it's, not not a, even, it's you know. really not a debate either it's a it's just kind of not a not a not a real i don't find it to be a very effective process but it's evolved because you know people want to make it theater and so it turns into theater political theater right right yeah like it's so you've done a lot of interesting stuff like the fact that you've been able to uh do 
a lot of things athletically, intellectually, you know, uh, being a being a peacemaker. That's and despite your challenges in your life with your disability, that's that's incredible. I, I commend you on that. Well, thanks. Uh, it's been an interesting life, and I I have to say that I landed in a really good place. Uh, I'm like I said, I'm really happy. Never been happier in my life than I am right now. Yeah, and uh, and I'm I'm so I'm glad that uh, we were able to uh, reach out and connect because I was as I was reading your as I was reading your your uh, your information, I was like, man, this guy's like fascinating. You know, he's done <laughs> he's done all these things, and he's you know at, at your age, you still got a lot more to go. Oh yeah, I'm just getting started. Just getting started. I've got a new project that I'm working on that 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 uh, people might be interested in. I'm I'm. It's called the Difficult Conversations yeah. Project. How many people do you know that have a difficult conversation that they've been avoiding because of the tension? That's a, that's a great question. I, I mean, I've seen quite a few, not too many. Yeah. So I'm I'm offering to facilitate between two people. They, if they both agree, I'll facilitate their difficult conversation, and I will guarantee it will be a transformative conversation. But the condition is this: we they got allow they have to agree and give permission to stream it live on YouTube, like a reality TV show. Interesting. And the reason that I want to do that is because I want to build up a library of, of facilitated difficult conversations to show the world that you can, you can take the most difficult conversation and make it a transformative experience for everybody involved. You don't have to carry around that 800 pound gorilla of tension and anxiety on your back because you're afraid that you can't have the conversation in a way that's going to work out. So if anybody's interested in that, um, they can go to my website, dougnoll.com, and find out more about it. Yeah, and, uh, and can they also, like, uh, I guess, uh, reach out for your services, too, if they want to, uh, I guess, inquire? Yeah, anything yeah. I mean, if, if people are interested in learning more about my work, you know, they can email me at doug at dougnoll.com, D-O-U-G-N-O-L-L.com, or they can just go to my website. They can You can contact me through the website. You know, the website's got over 200 pages of stuff on it. It's got a lot of material. So so you can learn a lot about me and what I do. And I offer all kinds of different services for people, whether it's training school principals and administrators how to de-escalate anger with parents and students, to working with law enforcement, to the prison work that I do, working in maximum security prisons, to training uh, organizations how to listen better, more deep effective effective deep deep listening and listening as leaders um just a whole broad range of things that i do for people all based on some foundational concepts that i've developed over the years that that is that is fascinating like like um yeah you're so far you've been out of all the guests uh, out of all the new guests i've met so far you've been the most interesting like the <laughs> fact that you've been able to do all yeah like I never, I never knew you could, you could do just all that, especially the, the mediation side is what really like gets, gets to me, you know, like, like there are other ways to, to de-escalate situations. Like, you know, I, I deal with, I deal with my, my, uh, my students and, and we have ways of trying to uh, de-escalate situations, but now that you kind of uh, open my eyes to different ways, it's something that I want to look into, you know, especially because yeah. I, yeah, one of, the things, one of the things that I teach, David, that you might be interested in is I teach people how to listen each other into existence. And so you're working with these teenagers who are coming from broken homes. They have never felt emotionally safe. And um, they're emotionally wounded. And to your point, they're at risk because of all of this. The, the greatest gift anybody can give these kids is to learn how to listen to and reflect back their emotions. It, and it's a process called affect labeling. I've been I discovered it in 2005. My fourth book, De-Escalate, How to Calm an Angry Person in 90 Seconds or Less, came out in 2017 based on all my years of experience using affect labeling, teaching affect labeling to thousands of people. And that is, that is the one foundational skill of life that I think everybody should learn. How do we listen to each other? And the, the trick is not to listen to the words. The trick is to ignore the words and listen to the emotions. And I'm gonna I'm gonna keep that in the back of my mind when we have a, I guess when I have a conversation with my student, just try to listen to what you do. What you do is say, "Oh, you're really angry. You're really frustrated. 
you feel you don't you feel ignored and disrespected you don't feel appreciated and you're anxious and concerned and worried a little scared and sometimes you're embarrassed and humiliated and you're sad and depressed and you feel all alone and there are times when you feel completely abandoned and rejected and nobody loves you and you feel like you're completely unlovable just say that and it will completely change their lives yeah like you know i the, the you know we talk about things you know with the, you know what's going on with family the home and things like that and like i i know ne i've never seen it that way so uh maybe you know it's something i could try now moving forward see because there's sometimes where you know i speak with the student and they'll be like yeah everything's fine everything's okay i mean you know they, they don't really open you look of course up. but i mean 13 14 and 15 year olds are not open to begin with because they're scared to death they're frightened they're frightened little bunny yeah. rats underneath and they don't they don't know what to do so they say yeah everything's fine they say oh you're really pissed off you're really angry and you're frustrated and you're completely ignored disrespected you're insulted at times nobody appreciates you nobody supports you nobody listens to you you feel completely invisible and unheard and you got a lot of anxiety around that. Just those words, just saying that. When they say, I'm fine. Underneath, underneath, there's all, there's a whole cauldron of emotions that they, they probably don't even know that they're feeling. And when we help them get in touch with those feelings, they feel a deep sense of relief and gratitude because they feel like somebody finally heard them. Oh, you know, I, I uh, definitely appreciate your advice. Like I'm, Definitely gonna keep that, keep that in like my uh, my mental notebook. So when I, next time I'll have a conversation with them, I'll I'll bring that up and maybe it might help me get more more in touch with their emotional side versus right. just words. I've got know? I've got a lot of YouTube videos out there on this stuff. I've got a lot of articles on my website that I've written about this. So if you just take the time to go through some of my many of my blog posts about around de-escalating and calming people down and then go to my youtube channel uh i actually have two of them and you, you do emotional there's uh, the power of emotional competency and then the other one is just doug noel douglas noel um and on, and i posted many 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 videos on all of this you can watch me do it how i do it a really great video to watch is how to calm an angry child in 30 seconds or less that that video has had over 100 thousand views i think wow um I did it a long time ago, but it's still valid. And it will show you exactly what I'm talking about. How to calm an angry child in 30 seconds or less. Yeah, I'll definitely be looking into that. And um, and also to my listeners, if you're if you're dealing with a situation like that, whether it's a child or an adult or any any individual, definitely check out Doug's uh, channels. He's very uh, very informative, very educational. And I'm very grateful that we were going to do the episode today. And I learned a lot about not just him, but myself and how to handle certain situations. So, Doug, thank you. You're welcome, David. And uh, as far as this episode, you're going to find it on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and every other major podcasting outlet out there. Doug, once again, thank you for being on. You have a great evening, David. Thank you. And you guys have a great one.